Okay, so um, you would have already seen uh, how to handle nonlinear systems uh, which are uh, uh, which do not have an input. Now, uh, a very clever thing which was done was that when you try to analyze these nonlinear systems, which uh, uh, which uh, which do not have an input, you can actually decompose that into two separate things, one a linear system and the other you pack all the non-linearities together and then when you want to talk about the stability of the equilibrium point of this non-linear, the original non-linear system that is equivalent to talking about the stability of this interconnection between the linear system and that non-linearity. So, let me try and explain what, uh, what I mean by this ok so suppose you were uh, you were to look at an equation like let us say the second derivative of y plus um, let us say the first derivative of y squared plus let us say 2 times y equal to 0. Now, one wants to analyze the this system. This system is a system without any inputs and uh, there are well known methods of uh, trying to analyze the system, but what I was just talking about was uh, this clever way of thinking about this system as an interconnection between a linear system and a nonlinearity. Okay? So, now let me try and uh, give you how that is done. So, think of this equation d 2 y d t squared plus 2 y equal to u. This now is a linear system. Okay. Now, this is exactly like this equation except that you could think of this d y d t squared as min, uh, minus u. So, let me put that as the next equation which is u equal to minus d y d t squared and this is the non-linearity. Okay. Now, the interconnection of these two systems then would give us exactly the same as this original non-linear system. Okay. So, uh, let, let us look at what this interconnection would look like. So, so if you look at that system d 2 y d t squared plus 2 y equal to u, this is a linear system which has transfer function given by y s by u s. This is the transfer function g s which is equal to 1 upon s squared plus 2. Okay. So, now let us think of this g s in this way and here is the input that you give which is u and the output that you get for this which is y. You take this y and put it to a non-linearity and this non-linearity has the characteristics that if the input to the non-linearity is psi, the output is psi squared. Okay? Now, in this case, if we now feed back this thing with a negative feedback, then if this E, which is the input of this, this feedback loop, if this E is set to 0, then what we would be looking at is exactly the original equation that we had which is d 2 y d t squared plus d y d t the whole thing squared plus 2 y equal to 0. So, so talking about uh, this closed loop system being asymptotically stable for example is exactly the same as saying 
uh, that the original nonlinear system is asymptotically stable. Now, of course, in this system, we can uh, clearly make out that uh, the, the, the system would have the, I mean, if you draw a phase plane portrait of the system, then the origin is an equilibrium point. Now, the origin is an equilibrium point if one wants to find out whether this origin is, let us say, asymptotically stable, that is the same as in this feedback system, whether that given system, this feedback system is asymptotically stable. So, if you, if you set up this feedback system and set y with some value and then you let this system evolve and if the system evolves finally settling down to the value y equal to 0, u equal to 0, then what that would mean is this system is asymptotically stable and what that effectively means is that the original nonlinear system is effectively stable. Now, this clever trick is, I mean once this clever trick was discovered, this was used again and again. Uh, so, the nonlinear systems were analyzed by looking at uh, uh, splitting it up into a linear system and a uh, nonlinear part and looking at the feedback connection of this no linear system and this nonlinear part. Now, once that was done, then, then people came up with uh, some sort of a conjecture. Now, uh, okay. Uh, so let me uh, let me give you uh, what this conjecture was all about. Okay. So suppose you had a system like, um, let's say, uh, similar to the earlier one, but uh, d two y d t squared plus let's say um, three times d y d t plus uh, let's say uh, two times y plus y cubed equal to 0. Okay. So, this now can be split up into a linear system. So, the linear part would be given by a transfer function which is 1 upon s squared plus 3 s plus 2. And the nonlinearity, the nonlinearity that you would interconnect with this linear system is given by something where if psi is the input, the output is psi cubed. Okay. Now, if one looks at this nonlinearity carefully, this nonlinearity, so suppose I think of psi which is the input to the nonlinearity then the output to the nonlinearity is here and this looks like uh, something like that. Okay, so, that is psi cubed. Okay. Now, uh, the conjecture which was made was made by a person called Eisenman and Eisenman made the following conjecture that suppose you have a nonlinearity and let us assume that this nonlinearity uh, is um, is memoryless. Okay. So, what do I mean by memoryless? Uh, what I mean by memoryless is that uh, this nonlinearity, uh, it only uh, the output of the nonlinearity only depends upon the instantaneous input. Now, the earlier nonlinearity that we looked at where the input was psi, the output was psi cubed and this output was independent of, um, of what the past values of inputs were. Yeah? So, it is a sort of um, uh, the output only depended upon the instantaneous input and so one could think of this nonlinearity as a memoryless nonlinearity. Okay? So, typically if you look at a nonlinearity which is memoryless it might be you know something like that okay so this here is the input to the nonlinearity and this is the output to the nonlinearity so when you have this as the input then the output is this value here okay and since it just depends on the uh, okay, so this curve, of course, is a slightly twisted curve. So it looks like you know, with this input, there might be multiple values. But let's assume that the curve was straight enough so that such a such such a situation never arose. 
Okay. So, the output purely depends upon the instantaneous value of input. Now, uh, the conjecture was made by this person Isoman and his conjecture was the following. You see, if you look at this nonlinearity at each point, there is some tangent to the curve. Okay. Now, one way that you could talk about this nonlinearity is you could limit the nonlinearity. So, this particular nonlinearity, for example, one could say that 0 is less than or equal to f of xi by xi, which is less than or equal to infinity. So, this is a nonlinearity whose slope, instantaneous slopes, lie between 0 and infinity. Okay. Uh, so, of course, uh, I am sorry, but initial curve probably had uh, had slopes which were greater than infinity, but this this one is uh, some trajectory uh, or this is a nonlinearity which has its slopes lying between 0 and infinity. Okay. Now, um, if one looks at uh, such nonlinearities, so so, let me let me give some more examples of similar nonlinearity. So, you could have a nonlinearity like that and uh, then clearly all the slopes of this nonlinearity lie between this line. So, if I call the input xi, so this line is k times xi or k 1 times xi and there is another slope here. So, this is k 2 times xi and so this particular nonlinearity one could say satisfies the characteristics that f xi by xi is less than is greater than this particular slope k 1 and is less than this other slope k 2. Okay. Now, uh, uh, suppose we interconnect this nonlinearity. So, this nonlinearity is interconnected with a linear plant G s okay, in this feedback structure and then suppose this linear plant was such that if instead of the nonlinearity, if instead of the nonlinearity you used a linear gain k and this k was between k 1 and k 2 and the resulting linear system was stable, then Isomann's conjecture was that if you put the nonlinearity instead of that linear gain, then the resulting system would also be stable, would be asymptotically stable. Okay. So, uh, the idea being that uh, if you are at this point and this was the input, then there is some slope here. correct? Now, this slope when you put that linearity, the resulting system is stable or asymptotically stable. Okay? Now, if the resulting system is stable, then the, the guess was that for the nonlinearity, because locally it is like, like this linearity here, therefore, it will behave nicely. So, now as a result of course, the system evolves and you go to some other xi and at that xi there is some other slope. Now, this slope when you put in as the linear thing, then uh, again you get a asymptotically stable system, asymptotically stable linear system. Now, uh, working in this way, the guess was that if you had a nonlinearity which lie, uh, which lay in some sector. So, this particular nonlinearity f of xi is uh, set to lie in the sector. So, it is a nonlinearity which lies in the sector k 1, k 2. Okay. So, if you have a nonlinearity which lies in the sector k 1, k 2, then if the linear plant is such that when you put feedback gain any gain between k 1 and k 2 and the resulting system is asymptotically stable, then if instead of that linear feedback you put the nonlinearity in there, then the resulting system is going to be asymptotically stable. 
So, this was Eisenman's conjecture. Okay? So, uh, perhaps I should uh, just, uh, just sort of formally write it down. Okay? So, uh, suppose that uh, the linear feedback system is asymptotically stable for uh, values of k in the range k 1 to k 2 then a nonlinearity that belongs to this sector which is equivalent to saying that the nonlinearity f xi by xi this is less than I mean k 1 is less than equal to this and which is less than equal to k 2. Okay. Then a nonlinearity of this kind in feedback with the linear system is asymptotically stable, asymptotically stable. Okay. Now, this is Eisenman's conjecture and this was given uh, roughly in 1949. Now, uh, initially it was not clear whether this way of looking at nonlinearities as approximation of linear systems is going to work. And in fact, in the literature for some time, this used to be called the method of linearization because the idea was that you have this nonlinearity and at instantaneous, uh, at various instants for a given input, there is an output and there is also the slope uh, of, the, uh, of the output according to the characteristics of the nonlinearity. And then uh, Eisenman's conjecture essentially said that if for all those slopes, that you get in the nonlinear uh, in the nonlinear function. I mean, if for all of those, if the nonlinearity is in that particular sector, the uh, and for those uh, for those gains, it turns out that the given closed loop uh, system is stable. Then the closed loop system is stable if you put in the uh, nonlinearity. Okay. It turns out that Eisenman's conjecture is false. And uh, this was proved by uh, uh, several people uh, over the years. Several people proved this uh, this thing. So some of the some of the more uh, famous names include Hahn, uh, who did this in uh, 1963. Then Willems. So Willems showed a counter example that this doesn't hold. Willems did this in 1966. Then there was Fitz, who did this also in 1966. So, they constructed all sorts of examples which showed that uh, this conjecture of Eisenman is not correct. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let me now give an example of a system where this actually does not hold. Okay. So, um, so, for this system, I consider the linear plant G s to be s plus 1 upon s squared. Okay. Uh, so, if you take this linear plant in a feedback structure, then it should be clear that for all k, for all feedback k in zero to infinity 
this given feedback system is stable. That means if you take GS and you give a feedback which is a linear gain K, then the resulting system is stable. Okay? Uh, we can see this in several ways. I mean, uh, we have already looked at this Nyquist criterion. So, perhaps we can draw the Nyquist plot of this G s. So, if this is the complex plane and we want to draw the Nyquist plot here, then as you start moving up, let us say from a small value epsilon, you start moving up. For the small value epsilon, you will get something here and you will have a curve like that. And uh, so, this goes right up to the top and then you have this infinitely large uh, uh, circle and corresponding to that you will get something here like this. And then you come up the negative slope and when you come up the negative slope, you essentially have the, the, the reflection of the original one. And uh, of course, this particular thing has a uh, double pole at the origin and has a 0 at minus 1. So, because of that to avoid this double pole, we can draw a small circle here of radius epsilon and uh, when you draw the small circle, when you look at its image here, you will end up getting something like this. Okay. So, now this contour C we traversed in this way, yeah, that means in the clockwise direction and as a result the contour that we got here using the Nyquist plot was something like this. Okay? And then the critical point is the point minus 1 and we find that this Nyquist plot, this contour, the image of the contour f of c this does not enclose minus 1 and therefore, the resulting system is stable for all gains, yeah, all gains from 0 to infinity. Now, now what I am going to do is I am going to demonstrate a particular nonlinearity which lies in the sector 0 to infinity. Now, uh, when uh, what do we mean by saying that a, a nonlinearity lies in the sector from 0 to infinity? So, earlier I talked about the slope, but um, it is not really the slope that we are looking at because the slope could very well be negative, but what when we when we are looking at f xi by xi and uh, this is xi and let us say the nonlinearity is like that. So, let us say this was f xi then when we are looking at this f xi by xi, we are really looking at this divided by this. And so, when you say f xi by xi lies between 0 and infinity, what you are really saying is that the characteristics of this nonlinearity should lie in the first quadrant that means when the input is positive, the output is positive or the third quadrant that means when the input is negative, the output is negative. So, the first quadrant or third quadrant. Okay. Now, that uh, the linear system that we looked at s plus 1 upon s squared, we saw that this particular linear system is stable. Uh, when you give, when you put this in a feedback connection, when you put this in a feedback connection with this k, with this k lying between 0 and infinity. Therefore, if now, because this is true and if Eisenman's conjecture were true, if we put in a nonlinearity here, whose characteristics lie in the first quadrant and the third quadrant, then the resulting system should be asymptotically stable. Okay? So, now what I am going to do is, I am going to demonstrate a particular nonlinearity which lies in the first quadrant and the third quadrant, but the resulting system is not stable. Okay? So, here is the nonlinearity 
So, the nonlinearity is given by the following equation. Mm -hmm. So, f of u, so if u is the input to the nonlinearity, f of u is given to be u upon e plus 1 times e. Here, e of course, is a number e, yeah. So, e is, is that uh, 2.7 something, 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 okay. So, this, this is the equation for f of u for u less than equal to 1. But this, if you look at this, this is like really linear. So, if you are going to draw the characteristics, you are going to get a line with slope 1 upon e plus 1 by e and this goes right up to 1. So, this being the input u input. Okay. So, this is the first part and now the second part for u greater than equal to 1, what you have is this is exponential of my, minus u divided by 1 plus exponential of u. So, here the characteristic that you are going to get is like that. So, now if you look at this nonlinearity, it lies in the third quadrant and the first quadrant. So, this nonlinearity given by this f of u in feedback connection with that plant. So, s plus 1 upon s squared and here you have the nonlinearity f well by Eisenman's conjecture, because s plus 1 by s squared is sta stable when you put any feedback k lying in the range from 0 to infinity. Therefore, this uh, linear plant with this nonlinearity defined in this way should result in asymptotic stability. Okay? Now, now, what I am going to show is that this resulting system is not asymptotically stable. I am going to demonstrate a particular solution to this particular uh, system, which is actually growing with time. Okay? And if you have a trajectory which is perpetually growing with time, obviously that system cannot be asymptotically stable. Okay. So, so, here is the is the particular solution that I am going to give you. You see when you put this s plus 1 upon s squared and you feed back through this nonlinearity, then you know I reverse the earlier trick. This is the same as looking at a system with the equation d 2 y d t squared plus f of d y d t plus y equal to 0. So, looking at this system is the same as looking at this system. Okay. Now, for this system, I look at a particular solution which is given by, so y of 0 is specified as e minus 1 upon e and uh, d y d t at 0 is specified as 1 by e. Okay? So, you one wants to solve this differential equation with the initial conditions y at 0 is e minus 1 by e and d y d t at 0 is 1 by e. Okay? So, I claim that for these initial conditions, the solution for this is given by the following. So, d y d t is equal to exponential of minus y t minus d y d t t. Okay. So, I am claiming that this particular thing uh, this particular equation gives us a solution uh, to this original system with initial conditions y at 0 being this and dy dt at 0 being this. Okay. So, uh, 
uh, how uh, uh, how do we show that this is a solution well let's differentiate it so y double dot that's the second derivative this is equal to exponential minus y minus y dot and then I have to take the derivatives of these so the derivatives of these will give me minus y dot minus y double dot so this y double dot I take to the other side and I end up with 1 plus exponential minus y minus y dot the whole thing multiplying y double dot is equal to exponential minus y minus y dot times okay so there's a minus times y dot uh, and so y double dot is going to be I take this below 1 plus exponential minus y minus y dot but now if you think about this I uh, I sort of uh, this exponential of some negative quantity is 1 upon exponential of the positive quantity. So, if I normalize this, I, uh, I mean or rather I, if I simplify this, I will end up with minus y dot upon 1 plus exponential minus uh, sorry y plus y dot. Okay. And for y dot, we had said that this is the solution. So, for y dot, we can substitute this. And if you now think of y plus y dot as u, then this expression is the same as, yeah, is the same as exponential of minus u upon 1 plus exponential of u. Okay. Uh, this minus sign is appearing essentially because when you take the f to the other side there is a negative okay so this particular solution is indeed a solution to this differential equation with initial conditions given by y at 0 is e minus 1 by e and dy dt at 0 is 1 by e okay now if you look at this solution then it should be clear that once this and this are the initial conditions this exponential of some quantity so dy dt is going to increase so when dy dt increases uh, i mean dy dt is positive so dy dt is positive means y increases so y increases dy dt increases and this exponential so it will continue to have dy dt to be positive and therefore y would continue to increase as time goes on which essentially means that this system is not asymptotically stable. So, this particular exam, example is an example which tells us that the Eisenman's conjecture is wrong. Okay. So, now at this stage, uh, there, is, uh, there was Eisenman's conjecture which was promising, but uh, it was shown that this Eisenman's conjecture is false. So, now um, what can we do? about analyzing general systems and uh, what sort of general theory can be uh, obtained which at least makes use of Eisenman's conjecture and Eisenman's idea. Okay? And so now we are going to talk about some things which essentially uses Eisenman's idea but gets past the uh, conjecture and gives an actual answer as to which systems when you interconnect you will end up with something which is asymptotically stable. Okay. Now, the inspiration for this thing comes this particular technique comes from electrical engineering and it comes from uh, uh, electrical circuits which are called passive. Okay. So, what do we mean by passive circuits? Now, uh, you must be knowing very well that if you have a circuit made up of passive elements, okay, whatever that passive element is, if you have a circuit made up of passive elements, then the resulting, uh, I mean, this, then the circuit is passive. Uh, this really does not give you an answer. All it says is that I am using the same word again and again. I am saying if it is made up of passive elements, then the resulting circuit is passive. What exactly is passive? Now. Uh, uh, a sort of a very uh, layman kind of um, 
definition for a passive system is the following. Uh, a passive system is something that does not generate energy. So what it means is, so if you have a passive circuit and you supply energy to the passive circuit, then that energy either gets stored in the circuit or it gets dissipated or lost. But a passive circuit does not generate its own energy. Okay? So maybe uh, we start by looking at some examples to get a generic idea of what passivity is. So suppose we look at a circuit which consists of just a resistance. Okay, so, the voltage that we apply, let me call it V, and the current flowing in, let me call it I. Therefore, the power that is fed into the circuit or the supply is V times I. Okay. Now, when you supply this, this current I goes through this resistance and it gets dissipated as I squared R, oh, that is heat or something. Okay. So, if you look at V dot I in this particular circuit and you look at the over a long period of time, that means say starting from time t equal to 0 to some time t, then this resulting thing is always going to be greater than 0. Okay. Now, one could use this as the definition for passive. Okay. So, when we talk about a passive system, then what we are talking about is that the amount of energy supplied to the system is positive. Okay. Of course, this definition of passivity may not, uh, I mean uh, this may not always strictly hold the moment we use some uh, element like um, a capacitance or, um, or an inductance. Yeah. Okay. So, let me try and explain what I mean by that. So, suppose now instead of a resistance, you have a capacitance. Okay. And uh, uh, suppose you also have a resistance here and then we apply a voltage V and the current going in is let us say I. Okay. Now, let me also additionally assume that this capacitance is charged and so at time t equal to 0, the charge on the capacitance is V c. And then let me short this. If I short this, then V that means the terminal voltage is 0. Therefore, if you want to talk about supply of energy, well the energy that is supplied in is V dot I which is 0. But of course, in this circuit we know something is happening. Uh, of course, even in this particular case, if you of course take the integral from 0 to t of v i d t, this is 0 which is greater than equal to 0. So, we could still continue to call it passive. Yeah. But now, suppose we apply a voltage v, so instead of a short, let us assume that we apply a voltage v 1 where V 1 is less than V c. Now, if V 1 is less than V c, then what is going to happen is from the capacitor, the current would flow this way. And so, now if you look at the supply, it is going to be V 1 multiplied by I, but I the actual current which is flowing is in the opposite direction to the convention that you use for I. And so, this quantity here is negative and so when you take this integral, you are going to end up with something less than 0. Yeah. But of course, you would already know that we call 
a capacitance, a passive element because the capacitance does not generate energy of its own. But uh, what is happening in this particular situation is that this capacitance at time t equal to 0 was already charged to some voltage Vc and so the stored energy is being dissipated. Okay. So, if we want to also incorporate the stored energy, one way we could do this is instead of taking this integral from 0 to t, we take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if you take the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of v dot i d t, then any circuit for which this integral v dot i, this is the power supplied to the circuit from minus infinity to plus infinity, if this is greater than 0, then we can call the circuit passive. All right. So, uh, so how do we how do we capture this this particular uh, notion of passivity so the basic idea is this so suppose we start off with a circuit and we assume that the circuit is at rest okay what do i mean by the circuit is at rest so the circuit could have several energy storing devices like capacitors and inductors the circuit is at rest by by saying that the circuit is at rest what i mean is that all the capacitors are discharged and similarly, all the inductors have no current flowing through them. So, there is no stored energy in the circuit. That is what I mean when I say a circuit is at rest. Now, suppose to that circuit, you now supply a certain amount of energy. Now, if you supply certain amount of energy, what do you think would happen in the circuit? Well, this energy which comes into the, into the circuit part of it of course will get dissipated part of it will get dissipated in the form of heat in the resistances but a part of it might get stored either as electrical energy in a capacitance or as magnetic energy in an inductance okay so what in very broad terms what we can say is that the total supply of energy this would be equal to total energy dissipated plus energy stored Right. So, now the total energy, the total supply of energy of course, uh, the expression for this would be V dot i. So, V dot i is the power dt if you integrate this from minus infinity to infinity. So, this is the mathematical expression for the total supply of energy. The total energy dissipated, well the energy dissipated uh, or uh, the power that is dissipated is given by half uh, is given by i squared r and so if you integrate this from minus infinity to infinity that gives you the total okay i guess i guess there's no half here it's just i squared r i squared r is the total amount of energy that is dissipated and you put this integral from minus infinity to infinity this is the mathematical expression for the total energy dissipated and what about the total energy that's stored well it could be stored in a capacitance and the energy stored in the capacitance will be something like this and there could be energy stored in the inductors it will be something like that so mathematically this is the expression that we will get that the total supply so your integral is equal to this integral which is the total energy dissipated plus the energy stored which is this okay of course this is an integral form so so this this equation that i have written down can be called dissipation equality 
Okay. And I can state the same dissipation, dissipation equality. This is the integral form. I can state it in the differential form, which means I just take the derivatives in each of these cases and I would end up with an expression like V dot i is equal to i squared r plus d v d t, where d v d t is the rate of change of energy stored in the circuit. Okay. So, then coming back to an electrical circuit, we call an electrical circuit passive if the supply or power is uh, Okay. Now, uh, the supply in terms of energy of course, is the integrated part, power is the derivative part. So, uh, perhaps let me talk about it as the supply in, in terms of energy, the energy supplied is, uh, is greater than the rate of change of stored energy. Okay, so, uh, of course, this is the rate of change of stored energy. So, actually, I am talking about the power. So, the supply power is greater than the rate of change of stored energy, then such an electrical circuit is called passive. Okay. Now, um, this stored energy is actually quite important. Uh, of course, electrical circuits are circuits which have an input and an output and uh, so when you talk about the stored energy, uh, this stored energy is something uh, that you have in a, in a system with an input and an output and this stored energy plays exactly the same role as a Lyapunov function plays in uh, a system without inputs. So, let me use an electrical circuit example to show that the stored energy plays exactly the same role as uh, a Lyapunov function in a system without inputs. Okay. So, uh, let us consider an RLC circuit. So, this is R, this is L, this is C and let us assume that there is some stored energy which is a half C V C squared plus a half L I L squared. Now, of course, this is a system which has an input and an output. Of course, uh, one could think of the voltage as the input, one could say that voltage is the input and this is the voltage that we are applying and the output is the current. One could also think of the current, I mean one could think of a current source here and the current pushing in, uh, being pushed in and the voltage that is generated as the output. So, it really does not matter whether you think of the voltage as the input or the current as the input. But here let us assume that the voltage is the input and the current is the output. So, this now is a circuit with an input and an output and there is a stored energy which depends on the current I L and the voltage across the capacitor V C. Okay. Now, here the input is V. If you set the input to 0, if you set the input to 0 that means you just short here then we have an autonomous system in the sense this is a system without any inputs. Now, when this is a system without any inputs, what is going to happen? Well, what is going to happen is there is going to be oscillation set up in this uh, circuit and uh, during this oscillations, the electrical energy which is stored in the capacitor gets converted into magnetic energy in the inductor through half the cycle. But of course, the current, this transfer is taking place through the current because of which there is some energy being dissipated and then the magnetic energy 
in the inductor is going to return that magnetic energy, convert that magnetic energy back to electrical energy stored in the capacitance and again some more dissipation is going to take place and in this way this keeps oscillating until all the energy which was stored in the capacitor and all the magnetic energy which was stored in the inductor gets dissipated and then you would have no current in the circuit. Okay. But now if you write out these equations, uh, the equations for this, this particular oscillation that would take place, well one way to write out is you, you just think of the current in the circuit and you can write down uh, the, write down the um, drops in terms of the current. So, you will get um, you will get the voltage drop here to be L d i d t plus the voltage drop here to be R times i plus the voltage drop here to be 1 by C integral i d t. This is equal to 0. Well, this is a second order differential equation. And this second order differential equation, uh, I mean, okay, so take derivative once and you will end up with LC, the second derivative of I plus RC times the derivative of I plus I equal to 0. Now, for this particular differential equation, if you use this V as the Lyapunov function, then this Lyapunov function is positive definite and if you take the derivative of this Lyapunov function, you would find that the derivative of this Lyapunov function is negative which essentially proves that this circuit is um, asymptotically stable when you, you convert it into a system without inputs. Okay. So, so, let me stop here right now and uh, we will carry on about this in the next lecture.